Thank you again for tuning in to today's show. It is virtual street talk. As I promised, we've had citizens in the community that have reached out wanting to share their voice with going back to school. So we have some professionals on today. Also, we have some concerned parents and citizens that would like to share their voice. Our first guest today is Dr. Paula Walker King. She is no stranger to this community because she serves it so well with so much passion. And she works in the field of public health, also operating in the field of epidemiologist, which is something that we all would love to hear from. So she's now serving in medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. And she's on with us today because this is very, very dear to her heart as well. Welcome to the show, Dr. Paula. Thank you for Thank having you. me. It's my pleasure to join you today. We are so happy to have you. Thank you for the invitation because this is a much needed conversation. And the community, I've received a ton of questions. And I wanted someone to be able to be on today's show that serves in the community with the people that are here. And you're a parent as well. So I'm pretty sure you will really, really understand the concern of the parents and educators as well. So for those that are watching, help them to know how long you've been in the field of medicine and how you also, how you started in this profession. Absolutely. Again, thank you for having me uh, um, on the show. I have been in the field of medicine. I would, I've been actually, I started my career in emergency medicine, working in acute care and working in the emergency department. I saw a lot of advanced pathology uh, where people were really, really sick. And I knew that there were windows of, of, of t intervention that had not been tapped. And so my passion uh, for public health was ultimately stoked. And I've been practicing in the field of public health for the last 15 years. And so I've been doing this for quite a while. I, I trained at Emory University uh, with uh, my Master of Public Health uh, degree. And I've been working with um, health departments uh, in different states and even here in our great state of Georgia uh, for several years and working with other uh, community-based agencies and organizations. Uh, one of the things that um, really, you know, drew me to uh, public health beyond uh, the fact that I saw a lot of uh, preventable illnesses within the emergency department was also the rampant uh, health disparities. Uh, that I saw where there were more individuals in African American and Latino and Latina communities that were impacted by chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancer, et cetera. And so when I looked at all of the, the moving parts and pieces, uh, public health is that domain that overlaps with medicine that allows uh, the practitioner to impact policies uh, that can change some of those circumstances as well as to work directly with community residents in helping them optimize their health. And so that's my career trajectory in a nutshell. Uh, started out again, emergency medicine and just moved right over to public health. And even with the, this coronavirus pandemic, I've been you know, playing a role in tracking uh, the data associated with um, the numbers. Yep. in terms of the cases and the number of deaths. Mm -hmm. Love that. And that's why we have you on today, because the educators, uh, parents, the community, they want to know the latest data. And you've been keeping up with that. And so you will understand their concern. We have school that is going to resume next week. And some will be virtual and some will not. They'll be in-person learning. Mm -hmm. And so... The community want to know where are we in Alabama, in Georgia? I mean, like, where are we now with the numbers? Yeah, so you know, it's interesting. So if you just even look at April 15th, that seems to be the pivotal um, marker uh, with the data. And I'm going to start with just the United States, because if we look at the United States, then it really shows, you know, on a macrocosmic scale what's really going on at the individual state levels. 
as of April 15th, from April 15th to now, uh, we have had over 637,000 new cases of coronavirus just between April 15th and today. In, if we look at the mortality, the number of deaths that have occurred, we've had 33,000 deaths here in the United States between April 15th and here we are at the beginning of August. And we've seen 33 people die, pass away as a result of this disease. Now, when we look at the distribution, uh, there are some hot, you know, epi, you know, hot spots, and we see them really uh, across the nation. Um, you know, Arizona, Alabama, Georgia. I mean, I don't know if you heard the case uh, just this week. Uh, a second grader uh, in Cherokee County uh, tested positive for coronavirus uh, infection. Uh, and so they just started classes Monday. Here we are Wednesday. And now the whole class and the teacher, and now they're quarantining for the next 14 days. Wow. And so what we're seeing here, when the, what the data has literally shown is that from the beginning of this pandemic, the cases have continued to climb. I'm just, I just highlighted between April 15th and today's date so that you could understand that we are continually uh, increasing in terms of the number of cases of coronavirus infection and the number of deaths that are occurring. We never flatten the curve, period. So that's the first point that needs to be made. You know, we never flatten the curve. When we opened, our states back up, the data was still on the incline. It was still, the, the cases were still going up. The, the CDC guidelines were very clear that before reopening businesses, reopening states, we needed to see a downward trajectory of the data. We needed to see a decline in the number of cases for at least 14 days before we considered reopening the states and that decline that decrease in cases was never witnessed it, it never occurred and so that's why we're seeing a resurgence of disease in communities across our nation so where even where it looked like um you know things were sort of steadying out they now you know it's just peaked and elevated all over again. And so we just have to be very mindful of now the fact that we have, we can move between states. So where a state has low, has a lower occurrence of the disease, because we can, you know, travel back and forth in between states, we're still putting all communities at risk. And so the long and short of it is that the data shows that this pandemic is going strong. It has not dampened in the very least. And I, and I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, just looking at the science of virology and the coronavirus family of viruses, we thought, okay, maybe this will perform like the flu virus. And when it becomes warmer, uh, the, the, the cases will decline. But COVID-19, coronavirus, he's shown he's a bad boy and he's, he hadn't gone anywhere. And it, even though it's hot outside, he has, the, the cases have continued to increase. And, you know, we were really looking at a very novel, a very atypical virus uh, with this uh, SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus uh, that, we, that is causing COVID-19. Absolutely. Great, great information. I want you to hold tight. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to bring in a former Board of Education member. She's going to share with us, and then after that, we're going to bring in the parents as well. It's Street Talk. We're talking about going back to school. This episode, this show today, is from the voice of the community. These are concerns that parents and educators and professionals have. Stay tuned. You're watching it here on cable TV. Thank you again for tuning in to today's show. It is Virtual Street Talk, and we are here talking with some public professionals and former educators, and also we have some parents that are on today's show as well. Some will be muted, but they wanted to be able to be on to share their voice. So at this time, we have Ms. Linda Parker, 
who is a former Board of Education member, and she wanted to come on because she's so passionate. I wanted her to be on because I wanted a voice for the educators. And she is so passionate about education, period, children, educators. And she's about bridging the gap for our educators. So thank you again, Ms. Parker, for being on today's show. Thank you. So thank you. Thank Yes. Yeah. So let the community know how long you've served on Board of Education when you served. Yes, I served on the Muscogee School Board for 12 years as an appointed member from the grand jury and the rest of the years as a first elected board in Muscogee County for 12. Yes, yes. Yes, and, and we appreciate your service, and, and you're still volunteering in the community and serving and helping as much as you can. We appreciate yes, yes. you for that. Yes, I'm a parent, parent and a great grandparent, okay. um, and so I'm very concerned because I have um, relatives who work in the system, and it's important for me to say something. Okay. And I thank you for uh, inviting me. And Dr. Paula says it all because she said that this virus is still alive and well, which some people don't believe. I don't think they believe it because no one should have to compromise their health for their job or the health of, of our children to get an education. They can learn virtually. The ones who want to learn are going to learn. Is nothing going to be taken away from them? Uh, the teachers and the staff, they're afraid. They're afraid to say anything. You know, they're just going to go along because they know it may be some uh, retaliation, uh, reprimand. Uh, 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 uh. They're going to be subjected to something that they don't want to be subjected to. And they know that these parents, I mean, the teachers, they know that they have to work. They know that they have to work because a lot of them have underlying conditions, illnesses, uh, like everybody else. And I feel there's no rush. What's the big rush to have in school participation right now? Uh, the virus, the COVID-19 is nothing to play with. I mean, can't we understand that? I believe we are playing with Russian roulette if we let our parent, our teachers and our students go back to in school, to go back to school at this time when there's no cure. That right, Dr. Paula? There's no cure. They're working on it. The scientists are working on it, but nothing, nothing nothing you're you're right there's nothing i mean there there is no cure for covid-19 or coronavirus illness we have right. supportive measures supportive care and medications that we you know supply you know ox supplemental oxygen remdesivir and and uh dexamethasone and some other medications uh that we are using to, to, to help support people in their mm -hmm. recovery, but we have no definitive treatment or, or, or cure, you know, for this uh, illness at all. Absolutely. So you're right, Mrs. Parker. Right. And, and the health of our, uh, the health and safety of our teachers and our uh, employees, now these children has to have to go back home. You know, I don't want my family members. Now we kind of be together. But now that they are back in school, I don't want them coming around me because I have underlying condition, a condition, and they can't come around me. And so it, it, it's making it very, very difficult. And you're talking about children going back to school, social distancing, and wearing a mask all day. Do you really think that's gonna happen? I mean, that's why we have school boards school board members and i know and i'm not saying that the school board members and the superintendent don't care about our children but i know that they're 
or other things that I may not even know. But I do know that Dr. Dr. Paula had just stated 33,000 people have died as of this day. Is that right? Between so, April, April 15th and today, and, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, all these people now did not have an underlying condition and they wasn't old. Mm -mm. All these people didn't have all of that. Some of these people were healthy. True. Wow. So you have a valid point, and I believe I remember I recall of someone mentioning about intergenerational family. Dr. Paula, you can speak to that. Yeah, so you know, part of what we're seeing here play out by the in society at large, including the school boards, is that there's been so much mixed messaging around the pandemic. And we were, we're, we're, the fact of the matter is there's this fallacy or untruth that's being uh, spread that children cannot catch coronavirus. Well, we know that part of some of those, uh, that number 33,000 deaths between April 15th and today, August 5th, there, some of those uh, are children. Uh, that uh, would die from the illness. Um, this whole thing about children as if they, you know, referencing children as if they operate in a vacuum, you know, saying that children can't catch the virus, that, um, you know, they won't get sick. Children, by definition, are in contact with other people. They can't supervise themselves. So when we talk about the intergenerational family, the, a lot of the children that uh, there's a, a push or, uh, uh, you know, advocacy for them to go back to school, a lot of them live in intergenerational homes, meaning they may live with parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. And some of the people that are in their households may have underlying illnesses or other vulnerabilities that put them at a heightened risk for developing coronavirus. And so just to look at it, this issue narrowly and to think, well, the child may not get a uh, coronavirus infection, but even if they function as an asymptomatic carrier and bring that virus back home into the household, introduce it into the household where now other older, uh, more vulnerable uh, individuals reside, it is still problematic, you know, for our communities. And so we cannot, number one, function with that, you know, overarching fallacy that children don't catch the disease because that is absolutely not true. Children have, they can catch the disease and they can die from the disease. Also, children can function Asymptom as asymptomatic carriers. So we have a double-edged sword here. And so, you know, where some children may get very, very sick uh, from coronavirus and require hospitalization, there are others that will simply be infected and, and, and not have any symptoms, but be a risk for exposing others to the disease. And so we have to give some consideration to intergenerational households. And even if they don't, live with their, you know, uh, grandparents or great grandparents, they still interact with them. And so we have to think about every member of the community and not just think about children in isolation when we examine such a, a dynamic topic as this one. Wow. Well, I would like to encourage uh, the school board members, you know, the school board uh, has one employee and that's the superintendent. And he gets, they get, he, she get mega books for doing um, their job. But at this time, the school board members have an opportunity to say, we need all virtual learning. We need all, and I understand in Phoenix City, that's my home, Phoenix City. I love Phoenix City, but I've been in Georgia, Columbus now for over 50 years. Um, I think they're gonna, they fixing to have a new board uh, in August. But they, I encourage them also 
to stop this madness because that's exactly what it is. It's a madness. And I understand it's about money. I do understand that. And teachers should be paid. I believe the federal government is giving um, money to the school districts. If you don't know what to do with it, then pay the teachers. Because this virtual learning is harder than, and I know that firsthand, is harder than in school teaching. It's harder. Um, it just need to end. It just need to end. We need all virtual learning until we get a better understanding because this is new to us and we do not understand what's going on. And we need to wait until we can see some progress. And right now, I don't think we're seeing the progress that we need to see for our children and our teachers to be jeopardized to um, for a lifelong, uh, life-shortened period. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, we're going to take a break. And I love that what you said. You ladies are basically saying these children, or the students, and the educators, they're all a, are attached to family. That's right. And we hear them. So we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and then we're going to bring in some parents along with Dr. Paula in Miss Linda Parker as well. We have some questions. I got a, a, a ton of questions. May not be able to get to all of them, but I'm gonna get to as many as we can. And then we're gonna let our two professional women on here share their views on it as well. And then also we're gonna hear from the parents. You're watching Virtual Street Talk. You're watching it here on cable TV. We'll be back after this. Welcome back to this edition of Virtual Street Talk. It is about going back to school. So we're on today talking about going back to school because we have parents that are concerned and is we understand that because we've never been this way before. We are in unprecedented times and parents just don't want to know what's going to happen, how it's going to be, how things are going to unfold. You know, they have a ton of questions and some of them felt like that um, their questions weren't answered. So they wanted to be able to come on this show today to be able to share um, their concerns. Of course, we don't have all of the parents, but we have parents that sent in questions. And so I'm going to go through as many as I can, and then we have some parents on, and then we have the doctor on, and then also Miss Linda, and then they can uh, chime in as well. But one of the main concerns parents have wanted to know is how many students are going to be in the classroom, and how are they going to ensure social distancing? Do anybody know? Do a parent know? How many students are designated to be in a classroom to make sure that we have social distancing for the students? So I talked to a student, I talked to a teacher um, from Russell County, and she informed me that they have adjusted the individual desks three feet apart, and that normally she'd have about 20 plus students but this year, based off of the spacing, she would only have 14 in her classroom. I'm not sure what other schools are doing, but that's what one of them are doing. Wow, okay, okay. And someone also mentioned about, will they be wearing masks all day? How is lunch is gonna take place, especially with high schoolers? So we've been told with um, Phoenix City that the high schoolers will be remaining in their class and, or, and their lunch will be brought to them. So they'll have a certain number of students. So around lunchtime, they'll stay in that particular class that's being held um, at that time and their lunch will be served there. And there will be like a one way, um, I guess you would say traffic um, when they do exchange classes. So as far as the number of students being in a classroom, that we still haven't been told. And my concern as a parent is, well, I've seen on the news where, I don't know, I think it was India or Indonesia, some country has students like in the plastic, their desks, their tables or what have you, they are protected. But when you say you have high schoolers who are supposed to wear masks all day, I don't even think the younger kids are gonna wanna stay in a mask all day. Um, but my concern is if they don't, how are you going to 
what type of controls are you going to be able to put in place if these kids are not six feet apart and if they've already been exposed and they're asymptomatic and they're in that closed room setting and you don't know that. So we don't have those answers, even though Phoenix City has published um, two reopening plans, they did not address that adequately. So it still raises a high concern with me and the risk that it poses. Wow. Wow. And it's, and it's interesting that that parent um, that just weighed in, she said that they, they're going to have only 14 students, but the desks are three feet apart. What is <laughs> they're supposed to be at least six feet apart? And so that should be even fewer students to accommodate a six uh, foot distance between each student. And so you can see already the compromise in the recommended guidelines. Uh, they're, they're, it's almost like they're trying to meet it halfway, but still not fully, full of full compliance uh, with the safety guidelines. Um, because we know at least six feet have to be um, in place because respiratory droplets can travel at least that far. Uh, and, and I'm curious, you know, maybe one of the parents can weigh in. Is that mask policy for Phoenix City, is it mandatory or is it a recommendation? Because you, there's a big difference. And we, we're seeing where even companies and businesses, they recommend that all customers wear masks. But then you're seeing some patrons still go in those businesses without masks. So is it a recommendation or is it a mandate to wear a mask? That's a good question, uh, uh, Dr. Paula. Um, according to the uh, final phase uh, reopening that Dr. Wilkes uh, had rolled out, they mentioned that the students are required to wear their masks. However, the word mandatory is nowhere in there. It was not in there on the first uh, phase and on this final phase, it's not on there. It just mentions, I'm looking at it, that they would be wearing, required to wear masks. But again, you pointed out uh, a great point as when you go into Chipotle's or you go into some of these other stores, yes, they have the signs out, please wear your mask. However, you have individuals come in there without any mask and they're not making or saying anything to them. They're not putting them out the stores or, or any of that. So that's, that, that's a big concern for me as a parent. Um, where is the logic? Because when you ask, we're asking these questions, um, but, and then they refer us back to the final phase plan. But again, as you stated earlier, uh, as of back, what, April the 15th to today, 33,000 have died. Mm -hmm. And so where's the logic? in this and then I, I i really don't see any logic how can we send our kids back to school face to face when simply when back in march the numbers were much lower today it's higher so how exactly and jeopardize our educators our children our loved ones how I mean, how is this so? Another concern uh, is with, you know, Phoenix City is real big on their, their rating. We're rated uh, A in a rate A category, you know, for the state, you know, um, Phoenix City's district, I should say. And that's awesome. The, the improvement in the grades, the numbers, the statistics and everything is showing that the educators are doing everything that they need to be doing. That's fine. But at the end of the day, because you're trying to be number one and do be the first to do this, it has no value or price over our lives, over our babies' lives. 
um, that's saying to me that you really don't care too much about my child. In one breath, you're saying that you do, but in another breath, you don't because you're trying to push the educators, the, the, the children, you're trying to put them in a, a, a situation. And I'm just really curious on how this thing is really going to turn out, considering if you look in Georgia, Gwinnett County, 260 teachers tested positive. If you look go and look at the uh, clipping where someone sent a picture out in Paulding County on their first day back to school, I didn't see any masks. I only saw a couple, about two students in the hallway with masks on, and there was no social distance. Everybody was, you know, crowded all on top of each other. So, again, where is the logic, considering where we were at April the 15th, and today's day, we're at 33,000, and the curve has never flattened, not one time. I hear your heart cry as a parent. Exactly. I really do. I hear your heart cry as a parent. And wow, I, I, I wish I could give you more. Um, but I definitely will sh make sure we share this with them as well. But another question is, and I'm pretty sure a lot of parents have a concern about this as well. This is in regards to sports. They want to know how will you be able to keep the kids safe considering sports are contact. And with the sweating and calling out plays like football and things like that, how, what are the, the plan of action for playing sports? And that's what some of the parents are concerned. Um, there's a lot of them that have withdrawn their students from the sports activity. So do any parents know? Because you're, you're being a voice for some of those that don't have answers as well. Um, my son attends Russell County High School, and one of the things they did immediately until they got proper guidance was it, all activities immediately cease. And I thank Dr. Coley for that and her staff. Um, all activities had to immediately cease until they got a better plan and a better strategy. For example, my son is in band. Now, I've made the conscious choice and the conscious decision to safeguard my son and not send him to band camp. And the band teacher, I'm grateful to Mr. Ray, has said band camp this year is not mandatory, but the children will still be able to participate in band. And so what they're doing, though, in camp, they are bringing them in smaller groups, smaller sections. And they have to remain, like you said, the properly um, the proper six feet distance. Even that includes um, that includes their um, break time and so on and so forth. My concern as a parent was, okay, I have that and I understand that, but that requires that they now be unmasked in order to play their instruments. And I was concerned also for the um, for the students that are involved in sports. How can you successfully manage that? For example, I need to be able to hit someone in football without without um, you know, being unmasked or what have you, how can I successfully do that? One, are you concerned about the children? Are they going to pass out because they're unmasked trying to practice, especially in, in the heat of day? Um, how can you, and, and even with the pros, they're doing it to, with limited um, limited means. However, if we, if we be honest and look at the general society where we are today, Russell County, for example, is Title I. We're Title I by default from me being, you know, retired military, so we chose to remain here. However, there are some other students that are in, for example, the Title I predicament that says, hey, listen, we don't have the funding. We don't have the choice. We have the choice, but we're not giving up on our district because they're hearing what it is that we're saying, and they've made some of the necessary adjustments. But when you have the pros that have the financial um, means and the wherewithal to get the best doctors, the best physicians, and so on and so forth, how does that impact us now here on the local plane for those that may not have that ability for those parents that have to go to work and then now your children may be latchkey kid because they have to go in um, inside, um, you know, have to go to work or what have you because they are the only, only source of income that comes into the home. Um, there were several other things that were said, but I'll address those later. 
but specifically about sports, they did immediately cause a cease. And now they're playing, um, as far as I know, for with the band, they actually have them six feet apart. Um, their breaks are also also um, spaced, properly spaced out. They have to put their masks on immediately. But as a parent, I didn't want to send my son back into that just because there's more of the world that's not open. And until more of the world um, is successfully um, reopened, I'm not going to put my son back in that environment. I would like to chime in on, on it. My daughter played uh, volleyball. And so I made the decision, absolutely not, after uh, being on one of the calls uh, for tryouts again and everything. And, you know, it's like carry on, uh, hoop rah, uh, it's You know, we're gonna, we got a game two weeks prior when the kids come back. And one of my questions were, well, what about the math? Are they going to be playing in a mask? Or, well, I really can't answer that at this moment. So they've been practicing. Some of those girls been out there practicing um, with their neck guard mask. But volleyball, they're close-knit. They're having to call out uh, of their plays. They're sweating. You know, it's a very intense game. But, again, no one cares. Again, on the football, I was going, going walking every morning down at the stadium. The boys out there on the football field, every morning in, in, in the sun and everything, did not see a mask at all. Wow. Well, let me ask you this. How is bus transportation? Because someone mentioned about bus transportation. How would that work? Russell County's reopening plan states that if you do ride the bus, um, you will be notified via your teacher um, and you will be required to wear a mask. What wasn't explained is how many kids are going to be on the bus or is it just going to be a normal transportation year? Um, but they were very clear about masks will be worn and they're going to take as many protocols as they can. If they have extra bus routes, that would be an option. So. Um, I plan for all six of my children in four different schools to actually go. Um, I didn't feel like I personally had any had a an option because of things like sports and things like that. I wasn't just thinking about now. I'm thinking about their future and scholarships. And I'm a little disheartened that we even have the option because I didn't feel like it was optional for myself. Um, so they will be putting on their masks and getting on the bus. Okay, I got another question here. I'm trying to get in as many as I can. Um, this is from a parent, well, an educator. How are we ensuring that internet service are being given to families who can't afford services? Do anybody have an answer for that? With Russell County, they've set it up where the students, um, because for the first portion of the um, the school year, they've actually did it 100% virtual. And so there are laptops that can be signed out, um, Chromebooks can be signed out, um, and they're also providing Wi-Fi. The challenge is, again, with it being Title I, if they are barely able to afford their meals. But of course, as a community, we'll rally together to make sure things are necessary. But um, for you have to pay $25 to be able to sign the laptop out, and there will actually be a hotspot provided for that. Um, my concern, and again, my concern that I voice as a parent is beyond just myself and beyond just my own family. Um, having been prior PTO with the middle school, um, my son is now a high schooler, is that those children that are in, again, that Title I phase, and this is with not just Title I, but children that may be in environments that are not conducive the best way for them to learn, are they going to be bullied at home? You know, will they actually be able to utilize those devices properly um, to get on the Wi-Fi, for example, the hotspot for them to do their work? Or will they be, you know, overrun or what have you? Um, one of the other things that happened when everything was they dispatch, dispatch um, buses that were basically like mobile hotspots, but then you still had to make it to the school or different things. So that's an, a change that they've done that the, um, the Chromebooks as well as the hotspots are actually available. But just still just making, you know, the question on top of that is who's going to make sure that these children are safe, that these children are actually able to successfully maneuver their education um, in of, you know, possible environments and, and possible um, situations in their home. We have a question from a student. This one is from a student and it's say, will virtual students get the same education and benefit as students that are in a classroom setting? 
will they still get the same, I guess, benefits, you know, the same reductions, you know, so I, for those that are in classroom? Because also one of them, and this is a part two, some of them are concerned about will they get help for, if they're struggling? I think that's a great question. And I just weigh in as uh, I've served as a professor. Uh, I taught actually at Columbus State University in the community for several years in their graduate program as well as their health science program. And what I can say is that online education has been uh, researched uh, thoroughly for several years now. Uh, and so we've got enough data to suggest that we can infuse quality into online uh, curricula to ensure that the same learning outcomes are achieved virtually as they would be in the classroom. And so that being said, you know, using that, that this is being an evidence-based, uh, you know, response that looking at the existing evidences and data and the, their way to structure curriculums, you know, to be delivered uh, via remote learning or, uh, online platforms uh, so that the, the, the learning does not have to be compromised. So I say that as the preface for any additional comments on uh, the matter, that it, it can be done in a way where learning outcomes are not compromised at all. Now, in terms of the mentorship piece, in terms of the tutorial assistance, uh, even all of that can be achieved. Uh, virtually. So I've had online uh, office hours where students that were having, I teach clinical human anatomy, for example, and uh, so, you know, students that were struggling in the anatomy course, they would meet me online in a Zoom portal uh, for designated hours, and I would be able to provide them the additional assistance uh, that they required and the support that they needed for uh, learning the course material. So, uh, again, demonstrating that the the, the uh, tutorial assistance uh, doesn't necessarily have to be compromised. Uh, neither does the overall instruction of any course uh, that is constructed uh, in in a well uh, is, is developed in a manner that is uh, congruent with uh, best practices in online education. Wonderful. I'm going to ask one or two more questions before we go into one of our final breaks and then we'll come back and get, you know, the rest of the question. This question is, will teachers be able to take temperatures upon students arriving in their classroom? How are they going to do that? Do the, will there need to be temperature check? And then also they want to know, like, what are you going to do when you have a sick student? How are you going to differentiate it? Anybody know? So PCS, PCS did um, in their reopening plan did say that there would be um, temperature checks. The teachers would be doing temperature checks. But my thing is, if they're not a medical profession, I mean, how do you really know? I mean, can they truly? I mean, the the temperature, um, or the thermometer will read the temperature. But at that point, if they're asymptomatic, will that truly let you know if your child is at risk or not? But they did say in their reopening plan that the teachers would be doing a temperature check for the students um, um, before they came into classrooms. Okay. So that's do, a very do, still, do the schools still have nurses? Most yeah. schools do in Phoenix City. They have at least one um, nurse on, on site. I don't know if all of them do, but um, there are some nurses I know um, at like some of the elementary schools, middle schools, and, and the high school. Okay. And, and that was a piece of information that I did receive this week that supposedly there was going to be at least one nurse at each of the schools um, in Phoenix City, um, you know, starting this fall. Uh, and so they may, that may have been the policy all along, but they were, they was, they were offering that piece of information as reassurance that there would at least be a nurse, you know, uh, on ground at every school um, in the Phoenix City um, area. And so that was um, secondhand information that I received. And so the parent, any parent can weigh in and, and, and confirm that as fact, but that was what I was told. 
And this is from a citizen in the community who's responsible for proper PPE for the school or the educators. Russell County is providing um, an initial phase. There's going to be an initial issue. Um, that was prior to them going to everything online. So there is a certain um, amount of stuff that will be initially distributed. Now, what's going to happen now since they've gone to virtually online, if those things will continue to be implemented or if they'll be, um, they'll be adjusted once we get past phase one. But right now we're in phase one. And again, we're grateful that Dr. Coley has basically said everybody will do virtual. Wow, that's good. Well, we're going to take a break, and before we go into this break, I will, since you mentioned Dr. Coley, I did receive a message from Dr. Coley, and because um, I wanted to be fair, so I sent a message to Phoenix City Board of Education Superintendent and Russell County Board of Education Superintendent, because I wanted to let them know that they had some concerned citizens that wanted to be on today's show to share their voice and their concern. And this message from Dr. Coley states, we have the best interests of students and parents at heart. We are here to serve the individual's needs of every student. We are utilizing as many resources as possible to include internet service, technology service, and learning resources to support the needs of families in Russell County Schools. Safety of all is our priority. We are working relentlessly to open schools with a safe return as possible. Also, she included in this letter, if you have any issues that have not been resolved or communication failures, she said to please feel free to direct an email to her at coleyb at russellcsd.net. That's directly from Dr. Coley. You're watching Virtual Street Talk. We'll be back after this. Thank you again for tuning in to Virtual Street Talk. We're talking about going back to school. Again, we've had a great panelist bringing the show to an end. So we're going to get in as many questions as we can because they had a ton of them. And that is all worth it. It's well worth it. One of the questions, we're going to get right into this. Is there a true contingency plan? if a COVID-19 case happens during school hours. Do anybody know? Your plan. So plan for, Phoenix, for Phoenix City, they've um, relayed that there is supposed to be like a quarantine room if a student or staff member tests positive. So it's like if they test, if they if they have COVID, they're supposed to go to this this holding area, um, so that you know they are not being exposed to anyone else. But again, that kind of segues into my question earlier: How do you truly know? And how do you how do just because the temperature check? Okay, so they're basing it off the temperature check. But how do you truly know that student or staff member hasn't been exposed to? 10 people and they're walking to the building, if they were on the bus, if they weren't exposed, and how do you truly know to get them to that holding area before anyone else is infected with COVID? And my other concern into that is that, well, you know, you see ML, the Major League Baseball, NBA, and all of these, um, you know, teams that can afford it, they're doing this, the testing where they get the results back ASAP, but here it is as a taxpayer, I'm concerned that I want my kid tested ASAP as well. And I'm and I don't like the fact that, you know, we don't know as much information as some of the school systems do and some of the board members do. And they're only giving us certain information, but at this point it's almost like it's not a man a true mandate to say wear the mask, don't take the mask off, and you you can only stay, you're actually, you're six feet apart. So I know I'm kind of going over, but I just want to make sure that as a taxpayer that, you know, the Phoenix City Board should have represented, uh, should have been represented here to make sure that, you know, you put the parents' mind at ease because as Ms. Patterson said earlier, we, as a parent said earlier, you don't know if, um, 
you know, we don't, we, we don't know. And everybody cannot speak on um, these particular things. They don't have the resources. Absolutely. So what am I supposed to do if my child has been exposed and you say they're over in that quarantine room and they, I think they're just supposed to call the parent and the parent come pick them up. Wow. So, so you had, so you, you, that was, that was a loaded statement. I mean, you touched on several uh, different uh, topics. Uh, number one, uh, in terms of the, someone that is identified to have a fever and they are subsequently quarantined. But then I think your question was, well, how do we know who all they were exposed to? So first of all, let me just say this, that we call this virus the novel coronavirus. I mean, it is new. It is novel. It is new. None of us have any experience with this particular virus. We are learning about this strain of coronavirus every single day in the medical profession, in public health. And so we don't have it all figured out. We, this is a new normal that we are navigating. And so part of navigating that new normal, number one, testing is one aspect, but then contact tracing is another aspect. So what you're touching on in, with your question is that now, how are we gonna do the contact tracing to see, okay, how many people, who was exposed to that, person with the fever on the bus and, and walking into the school and, 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 you know, possibly passing them in the hallway or the restroom. And so contact tracing would be part of that. And, and, and right now we don't have, it's an imperfect uh, system that is currently in place. And so there quite possibly will be loopholes and some people that are missed. So say we have someone that does test positive and we do the contact tracing and we try to find out who all they were exposed to or in contact with so they can know to quarantine for at least two, two weeks or three days. Uh, how we go about doing that contact tracing is imperfect. You mentioned about the testing, the, you know, the Major League Baseball, they have the rapid test, you know, available. And the tests, quite frankly, that are available in most hospitals and communities don't come back rapidly. We, you know, at least take a few days to get the results. And so we just have to empirically, if someone has, you know, a, a elevated temperature and they or and or they're demonstrating symptoms, of, of illness, then we have to empirically quarantine them for 14 days until we can find out the results. And even with the testing, that's imperfect too. We've had false negatives, false positives. And so, again, going back to my earlier statement, we're still figuring out this new normal. We don't have all of the answers as it relates to this virus. So, that being said, it is prudent to err on the side of caution and take as many precautionary measures as possible. And I don't think it would even be far-fetched if we just did virtual instruction for the rest of 2020. I know that's a reach and I know most superintendents and most a lot of people won't necessarily agree with that, but mm -hmm. Given that we're still information gathering, we're still gathering information and collecting data, learning about this virus, learning about how it will behave in the fall when now we have the influenza virus come into play. So we know that every year, like clockwork, we have uh, surges in flu cases, the seasonal flu, seasonal influenza. All right, so now you've got superimposed on top of the regular flu season. Now we still have this enduring coronavirus pandemic. And so how will we tease out, okay, now we have someone who has a fever and they're sick. Do they have coronavirus? Do they have seasonal influenza? We have to test for both. The presentations you know, you know, will mirror one another. There will be some overlap in terms of symptomatology, symptoms. So the, the, there is, you know, a, a lot, there is some wisdom in being more cautious and, and, and possibly 
you know, taking a step back and saying, how do, you know, what's the most excellent approach here? And should we err on the side of caution where we will protect and save as many lives as possible? And all I'm introducing, or I'm at least floating it like a balloon, the notion that it would not be entirely far-fetched, given what we know today, that the epidemic is, the pandemic rather, excuse me, the pandemic is actually, in terms of cases and mortality, the deaths is actually worse today than it was back in March, then we have to at least be willing to say, you know what, maybe virtual instruction may be something that we at least have to be open to considering. And I think that, you know, we just have to, I think this conversation is great because we're just raising awareness. Some, it might be in someone's blind spot. They may not have previously considered that, you know what, we are still figuring this thing out. And given that it's a bit of a conundrum for all involved, then it, we, we just have to consider how we uh, approach it as safely as possible. So I hope I answered your question in terms of the testing. You know, it's not all rapid uh, test results that are widely available, uh, despite what we hear, you know, being said from, you know, the president, Trump presidential administration or elsewhere, it, you know, it, it still it takes time, but we just have to empirically quarantine. And we have to contact Trace and have those individuals that we identify as possibly being exposed, have them quarantine as well. So it's an imperfect methodology uh, but it's, you know, given the fact that we're, we're figuring this problem out as we go uh, day to day, um, that's really where things stand. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the questions that we had also, and I believe um, this is from a parent, who, who makes the ultimate determination whether it's open or not, or virtual or not? The school board, if I heard you right. Who made the decision? The, 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 decision. the school, yes, ma'am. The school board. Okay. And the superintendent. If I'm going to caveat on that, the concern with once everything, for example, again, I'll speak from Russell County side that are, that are beginning their phase um, with the online. And once we, be on, we're, once we pass this window of the initial online, if you say everything is good and, and it's okay to go back, but I'm not okay with my child going back, what measures do I have? What alternatives do I have for now not sending my son back to school? Because of course, for example, if your child doesn't go to school, you can get picked up by the law. You know, just a few other concerns is that one of the things having been prior PTO is that I think as a community as a whole, Excuse me, and thank you, Ms. Loretta, for um, for an opportunity to even be here. Um, but one of the things is that we have to realize, just like Dr. Paula said, we're in uncharted um, territories territory that no one in our lifetime we've ever experienced. The biggest thing is to remain flexible, resilient, and persistent. But even as parents, and one of the things that I have, you know, acronym that comes is PBAP, and what that is is parental involvement beyond the pandemic, and before is before a pandemic. So where we are right now is it's going to take the parents to get involved beyond just sitting beside each other and talking right. about it and complaining, but getting involved inside the community to ask these different questions to put those different things out there so that we are aware. You know, like they may mention for Phoenix City, it doesn't matter what your numbers are if all your students are dead. And those are the children of the future. So then how we can how can we properly safeguard their future when they're not here? They are the next generation. So if I'm not okay with sending my son back because I'm not in agreement with the measures that have been in place and I don't I don't feel that they probably safeguard my child, then how who ultimately makes that determination and what alternatives do I have for my son's education other than pulling him from the district and then now trying to get him caught up in, for example, a K-12 program and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Ms. Parker, she's, you know, she said that, you know, in terms of the school board and the superintendents, they make the decision, but here's the catch, that the, those decisions should be informed decisions and the information, the guidance should be coming from public health officials. Uh, the CDC should not be overlooked in terms of its guidance and what we're seeing, a lot of, uh, you know, the presidential administration is weighing in on even the guidance that is being put out forth by our, uh, our, our leading public health agency, which is the CDC. And so long story short is 
the, the, the decisions need to be informed decisions. And so they need to listen to the public health officials. I think one of the best things that could have happened to the United States um, in, in, in terms of how to navigate this pandemic was is Dr. Anthony Fauci. I think he has been a truth teller, even when it has been unpopular to do so, even when, you know, to the point of being, you know, receiving criticism, but he has been very vocal and he's staying with the data and the science. We just got to follow the science, follow the data. And, 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 and so I, I would say that the school board and the superintendents of all school districts need to be open and willing to listen to those that have dedicated their, their lives to public health service and that have experience and expertise in the data. We just got to follow the data and the science and all of these other, you know, speculations, children can't get sick, you know, just, just pulling, you know, making unfounded, uh, you know, and unsubstantiated claims and assertions, that has to be left to the wayside. And we really just have to follow the data. And if we look at the data, then the decisions will be sound, you know, in terms of doing but what's for all involved. I'm yes. sorry, can I interject? But, but what, if you're looking at the data and you're looking, they're, they're saying in the reopening plan that they're following the state of Alabama health department plan. But when you look at that uh, map, when, you, when I see the map on national news, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, these states are red, meaning they are high risk. So if they're high risk, why are why are some of these schools returning not virtual, like, like um, the parents said earlier, Russell County is virtual for the first nine weeks and then they'll revisit. Phoenix City is saying, oh, we have all the virtual students we can take. We're not taking anymore. So if you didn't turn in a form, if you didn't turn in a form by a certain deadline, if you even knew you had to do that, and if you missed the deadline, you're out of luck if you want, don't want your child to return and they have no option but to go in in person. Or like she said, I guess the truancy officer will be contacting you because you are supposed to be on site as, a, as an in-person student. So if we are following the guidelines, truly following the map, if no, we're so truly following the map that says Alabama, Georgia are high risk, very high risk and in red, then we would all be virtual and there would be no question or concerns about my child returning in person because I know he's safe as a virtual student until it's okay. Exactly. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Listen, I said we should, the, 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 the school board and the superintendent should be following the data. I didn't say that they are because we could not even be having this conversation if they were following the data and following the science because you are absolutely correct. The science and the data says we need to stay closed. The, the states need to, we, we, back where we, how we were sheltering in place back in March, we need to continue to shelter in place. Uh, all data, all of it points in that direction. None, we should not be even contemplating having face-to-face -face instruction. So I'm with you. I hear you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that the data needs to be followed. The science needs to be adhered to. And right now, what we're seeing is more, hate to say it, but you know, for a lack of a better word, we're seeing more uh, uh, political usage of the data, yes. the political spin of the data, or some other ulterior means and motive. And, and, and that's really what's playing out here. But uh, so, and, and that's <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate, but it, 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 so I'm saying that in an idyllic world, that we will follow the data. And, and honestly, in an idyllic world, if we're following the data, it's not far-fetched to have virtual instruction for the remainder of 2020. We will not have a vaccine before 2020, right? Mm -hmm. We don't Dr. have a treatment. Let me Parents have to get involved. Parents has to get involved mm -hmm. um, because the school board and the superintendent is going to make the ultimate decision. That's it. Ms. Ms. Parker, you are have so to get right. Because you know our teachers, they are afraid. They're just going to do their job. 
Okay. Ms. Turner. I Ms. heard yeah. one of the parents uh, saying. Dr. Paula? Uh, uh, Ms. Rosetta? That the community as a whole, we need to get involved. We need not to be afraid because if we don't take a stand and open our mouths up, then they'll continue to do what they do. If we don't take a stand, then we don't stand for anything. We yeah. always talk about how lives matter, everyone's lives matter, but we have to be that advocate in the community because as Dr. Paolo and, and, and the other parents were saying, you know, about the data and, and about the, the, the numbers, well, let me just say this. I commend our other districts around us for going virtual for at least first nine weeks. Uh, Phoenix City, we're not taking that approach. And my heart is really torn with this because I feel like we're being used as gimme pigs, one, and two, that you're placing numbers, statistics, because you're trying to continue to be number one in the system, which don't work for me because like my sister said, if, if your students are dead, that means anything. That means nothing. That's gonna turn around quickly. So um, my question also would be to Phoenix City School, Mr. Wilkes, would you send your child knowingly, wholeheartedly, with the numbers from April the 15th to today's date, would you send your child to school knowingly everything that's taking place? My next question for Mr. Wilkes is that, is it financial? Is it about yeah. politics or financial no. uh, or finances uh, for, for, the, for the system of Phoenix City over our child's lives? And just this summer and wrap it up real quick on my behalf, if you look in the Phoenix City uh, letter at the end, it says the enclosing the welfare of the students remains the chief priority of Phoenix City School. Well, if that was true, then mm -hmm. you would at least for the first nine weeks have everyone go back virtually. I That's agree. <laughs> wow. Well, let me ask you this. I heard someone saying that the students didn't have an option to go back to go virtually if they wanted to. Even if it's an intergenerational family and the family has um, um, underlining conditions, there somebody you know, some family members wanted to know: is there? I mean, is there a, an, an exception for them to to be able to allow them to go virtually, especially if it affects the family or the student? Medical? That's a good question, Ms. Uh, uh, Rosetta, because the way it was put in here in Phoenix City, if you didn't meet the deadline within 24 to 48 hours, then you just, you, you, you wouldn't have that opportunity to be virtual. And the uh, superintendent also went on the news a couple of weeks ago saying that Phoenix City schools have accepted all of the virtual students that they are going to accept, no exceptions. This was on the news a couple of weeks ago. Right. And see, again, this is, this is when it requires that the, pam the parents get involved, more than just the parents, because ultimately it affects the home, it affects community, it affects your city, and then it ultimately affects your state and your nation. But if you don't band together, then your voices amongst one another is not going to be heard. It takes the voices in the uprise to actually get it to, for, for lack of better words, the powers that be. Um, I'll use, for example, um, when this thing first kicked off in March. Well, we missed the initial sign out a, you know, sign out a, um, a laptop for my son. However, what they did was they did all paper, paper copies for his stuff. And we had to get everything sent in and 
you know, so on and so forth. And I'm not sure if that's something that schools are looking to do, but this is also an opportunity for the community to band together and say, hey, Mr. President, we do have a problem here. And so we do need additional funds. So the funds you're trying to take away, they say, if you're not, you know, for lack of a better word, butts in seats, then we're not going to send you the funding. Well, the children still have to be educated. It's not like Canada take an entire year off when you're still saying that the kids have to go to school. You're still saying the kids have to be educated. Then guess what? If you know that these schools um, are even requiring additional state funding in the first place, then that means now with everything changed the way it is, we're going to require more funding. But again, it's, it's going to require the parents and those, in, those um, individuals getting involved. And more than just a voice talking to your neighbor, you have to actually make sure you rally together to talk to, again, lack of better words, the powers that be. Standing united, you're going to get more things accomplished than you can um, individually ever. Exactly. And I, and I agree with that in the sense that, you know, we have, we are, we're in an unprecedented season where we, it, there's a pandemic and there are protests going on. You know, people are raising their voices about things that are, have been existing, you know, in society a long time. And so there's a way to peacefully, uh, you know, come together as a coalition of parents uh, and concerned citizens and, and, and make um, the school districts, you know, aware of the fact that, you know, I understand that you have a hard and fast deadline, but you know, there are members of our family that have X, Y, Z diagnoses and, and have them reconsider. And, and, and honestly, if enough voices galvanize around the topic and, and, and bring it to their awareness, I don't see that I don't, I, I, it's, it would be, it's hard for me to fathom that they will be able to ignore the, uh, the strong collective voices of the parents, of, uh, of, of the children um, that they serve. And so I, I believe that, you know, giving, every, you know, giving the, uh, the, these, the decision makers involved the benefit of the doubt that these are, because we're navigating a new normal, these are things that we probably have not considered. This whole thing about being, you know, having being a top rated in the, you know, in terms of school, that was according, that was a rubric and a metric that pertained to a world that has since faded away. The world has literally changed right before our very eyes. We are living in a new normal, new way of doing things. And so what would classify you as a top white rated school is how you handle crises. Right. You know, how you navigate during times of transition, such as these. And, and so the rubric has changed, the metric has changed in terms of what makes you an outstanding school. And so we have to look at that and be willing to adjust, you know, with, with the changing times. And so I, I, said, I said that um, to this, uh, Mrs. Pa Patterson, that I, I, I concur with what you're saying. And I think that there is great value uh, in banding together and raising your collective voice as you know, parents and concerned citizens. Uh, we're seeing it elsewhere um, with the Black Lives Matter, Ma Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, if a, if if an episode, you know, if, if if something like just seeing you know a man murdered in cold blood, like George Floyd was, you know, move people to say, you know, let's say something, let's do something. Then surely uh, the passion that I hear you know, in this conversation, you know, can just be the seed uh, of a movement to mobilize the voices of concerned parents and citizens to bring these uh, loopholes, these, these, these gaps, um, you know, that have not been addressed. You know, how are we going to ensure the safety of all involved? You know, how are we going to make sure that this is a mandatory? Because if the policy of what wearing masks is mandatory, then you will tell me what happens if a child shows up not wearing a mask. All right, so little Tommy is going to be sent home, you know, until he comes back and be willing to comply with wearing the mask. Does that make sense? You know, but if you don't tell me what happens, what the repercussions are, what the consequences are of not wearing a mask uh, in the midst amid your requirement for wearing a mask, then that means that, hey, how do I know it's not like the Chipotle that the other parent mentioned earlier, where the suggestion is made, the recommendation is there, the sign is even posted, but people still go in and do their own thing, saying that, you know, I have a right, you know, to, to, to wear a mask or not wear a mask. And so 
I think there are wrinkles that need to be ironed out with the policy and plans that have been put forth. And I think that this is a, you know, a key uh, you know, opportunity for parents and concerned citizens to, um, you know, make uh, decision makers aware of these concerns. Awesome. Yeah. And I think you all have started a great conversation. We're going to get ready to get final thoughts from everyone. This has really, really been great. Um, I want to allow the muted videos first, those concerned voices. I'll allow you to share any final thoughts or anything that you would like to say as we get ready to bring the show to a close. Now, I know that several times over uh, we've discussed possibly um, the money situation and, you know, are these decisions made because of money? Now, I know um, a few months ago we did a Zoom parent involvement meeting for Russell County and we were told that she was there. Um, she allowed us to or let us know about the CARES Act and that they were given money to uh, do appropriate things to ensure safety as far as doing a one-to-one -one ratio for Chromebooks, which we didn't have before. Um, and thankfully, she did do that funding appropriately, and we do have a one-to-one. -one. So virtual is when she decided that, you know, we had to go online virtually, um, it was made available to all student bodies. Um, so I'm so grateful for that, and I don't necessarily think money is an issue. I think they are given enough money I think it's a matter of other issues that maybe parents and other people are not made aware of. Um, and I just feel for these administrators that do have to make these decisions, looking at all spectrums of families. Um, and I, I agree with that. Um, but I also think it may be, um, there may be some underlying issues of nepotism, favoritism within the school system itself. Um, you know, I don't know everybody that works in the school system, but I do think that, you know, if everybody is not on the same page from the superintendent to the teachers to the staff, well, of course, some people are thinking that, okay, I, I, I can't speak up because my job may be in jeopardy, but all at the same time, their health may be in jeopardy as well, as well as the health of the students. So um, I just want to make sure that, you know, the communication is there and and i agree with john r lewis i think we're going to have to make good trouble in order to get this thing moving forward awesome all right and then so also we're going to close out with um we'll start with our parents and then we'll end with dr parker and then dr paula will be the last two Okay, so for me, my recommendations are, one, follow the data. Two, total concern for not just your own, but for your neighbor to your left and your right. Three, is also to be concerned with your cities that are next to you and your left and your right. Because for example, although Phoenix City is going back to school, Phoenix City is still right next door, basically embedded between Russell County and Muskogee. So that still ultimately affects us because if you boil, if you put water in a pot, it's ultimately going to boil over and it's ultimately going to spill out. So if they're not exercising the same safeguards that Russell County um, and, and, Rus and Russell County and Muskogee are, my recommendation to Phoenix City is to go back, look at the numbers, regroup, come back in to resettle in to make sure that you're safeguarding everybody. We get it that it's uncharted territory. And because it is uncharted territory, use wisdom, see godly counsel as far as what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And don't let the data confuse you according to what, you know, money situation or whatever you think your kickback is going to be because we need the children available. We need the teachers available because ultimately this is our next nation of people, leaders that will continue to take this world to the next place. Well said. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Next, Aaron. Yes, I would, uh, like uh, my, my sister uh, said that to follow the data, Phoenix City, please follow the data. Please uh, look at uh, our neighbors, what they're doing, as uh, far as having all the, the kids go back virtually. Uh, I'm going to ask that um, instead of dictating to us, 
uh, what the plan is for Phoenix City. Have uh, be compassion and have some empathy uh, with your families of Phoenix City, your parents, your neighbors, and uh, just have our heart at best interest. In other words, get us involved instead of just telling us what we're going to do. I like that. I hear you as a parent. You want to be involved. That's good. All right, Ms. Linda Parker. Um, I would just like to say um, what I said earlier. There would be a new board in Phoenix City this month. And I would ask each candidate, how do they feel about virtual learning? And then at that time, I would decide which candidate I would support. All right. All right, and Dr. Paula. Uh, first of all, I just wanna you know, thank you for you know, in inviting this conversation. It's, it's just so needful at this particular time. I love what one of the parents said, just said in terms of collaborative uh, decision-making and, and that you know, inviting school districts, inviting parents to be involved in the decision-making and again, to exercise empathy and compassion uh, during these unprecedented times. This is something that, you know, what we're experiencing it has never been, uh, has never happened in any of our lifetimes. And so uh, it's just it's just a very uh, you know different terrain uh, to, to to navigate, and so we we have to be patient with one another. Uh, and so I'm just encouraging on that note um, for the decision makers involved to incline an ear uh, to community residents and concerned parents and be willing to uh, reconsider and possibly renegotiate um, uh, the policies that have been put in place um, to, 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 to be more inclusive of the of, of parent weigh-in, but also be more inclusive in terms of the existing data and science that we have available at the state and uh, national levels. Thank you. You ladies hold tight. I'm going to get ready to close out. We want to thank these wonderful ladies that have joined the conversation on this channel. Discuss. We want to thank those concerned parents. We want to thank those concerned educators that reached out that wanted to be a part of this conversation. And want to let them remind them that, yes, your questions, your concern matters. That's why we have this conversation today. And it is my prayer that our professionals and Board of Education will be able to listen to this and hear the hearts and concerns of our citizens, our parents, the students, and the educators. Because in order for us to be successful, they're going to need all that they need, the support that they can have, and they're going to have to be safe. So thank you again for tuning in to today's show. We want to thank those for being transparent and sharing your heart on today's show as well. I will like to remind everyone of this. As the students going back to school, and just be mindful of this, every child equates to a family. Mm -hmm. Every family equates to our community. Every community equates to the state. Equates to the United States. And, and it just goes on and on. And when I say we're all in this together, we really are. Because if you're not well and if you're not okay, it's going to affect me. It's going to affect the other person. So let's, let's come together. I hear your parents, I hear you all, and it is my prayer that this today's show will be able to be a blessing in some type of way. I pray that a blessing come out of it. So we want to thank those for being on today. Remember, life is all about what you make it. That what you put out, it will come back. We want to thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of Virtual Street Talk here on cable TV. Mm -hmm.